our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. Welcome to Unspun, the podcast that makes you better at finding the truth. The way people get news is changing. It used to be that there were many reporters who would research stories and write articles, but now politicians and famous people share information directly with you on social media and the internet. That means you find out things fast, but it's up to you to make sure the information's actually accurate. And newsmakers don't always do their part. The temptation to manipulate information is strong. They bend the truth to deceive so that they can avoid accountability, so that they can advance their agendas. When you recognize these agendas, you can sometimes find out what's real. And we're at a crossroads where anyone can share anything online. So it's important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Finding that deception before it goes viral is pretty much a survival skill now. And we're going to do it together. Let's get unspun. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Unspun. We're coming into election season. The primaries are winding up, and we're going to be getting into the big campaigning, and pretty soon it's going to be election night. And I have to tell you, election nights always make me feel a little bit wistful. When I used to work for a newspaper, election night was such an exciting time. I was usually the person who was back in the newsroom kind of compiling stuff together, and all of my friends were reporting, and they were all out at the various campaigns, They would usually have a party in a restaurant or something like that, and they'd be, you know, tracking the returns, and they'd be interviewing the candidates or interviewing people from the campaign, interviewing their voters who were there to celebrate with them. And it was just a super exciting time. And once enough of the returns got in to call the election, it was usually, you know, three or four in the morning, and we'd go to the all-night diner and have some terrible coffee. And it was just, uh, I always feel like I should be doing something on election nights. And we can fast forward to when I became a professor and started working with college students. And my students were really the first college to publish election results straight to the web on an election night. And this was really an exciting um, time for us and for them. We were all seated up in the newsroom and waiting on returns to come in. And we were getting them from the county election officials. And we had been out talking to the voters and done a bunch of things about the issues and those kind of things. And we were waiting for that big moment when we got to share who won. Unfortunately, that was the year of the Bush versus Gore election, and you may remember we definitely did not have a decision on that election night. In fact, it was several days later while they worked out hanging chads and voter intent and all kinds of things like that. But it serves as a big reminder to me that the media play a big role in elections, and so much so that um, in my professional organization, one of our largest divisions is the one that deals with political communication, and for good reason. You know, researchers have been studying politics and communication together for a while. And according to a researcher named Gerth, you know, the stories that people read in the news actually help them to form their opinions about who it is that they're going to vote for. Uh, And then on the flip side, the media also let politicians maybe influence the voters. And in particular, that's kind of moderated by how good of a public relations effort that they have. And it turns out that campaign communication is really a big business. I have Several students who work in campaign communication now have graduated, and I have others who are in school now and hoping to do that when they graduate. According to research from Europe, they find that American media tend to cover elections a little bit differently than European ones do. So in European elections, they tend to cover politics as issues, right? The things that the politicians are actually going to do when they get into office. And in the U.S., they cover it more as a game. And They will use frames that they call like the horse race frame, who's in front, who's making a move, those kind of things. Or they'll use what they call a strategy frame. And my friend Daniela Dimitrova has done some work on this as well and talked about the strategic game. And in particular, she talked about the kinds of sources that different stories use. So for example, if it's a story about strategy, so what are the techniques that a campaign is doing to get themselves out in front of voters or to convince more voters to vote for them? They will use sources that are largely media analysts or, in some cases, campaign workers. If they're doing sort of a conflict version of the story, remember we talked about that conflict news value a few episodes ago and how that's one of the strongest ones in attracting audiences. For a conflict news value, they'll often be talking to the politicians themselves. And when they're doing issues stories, their sources tend to be more regular people, the ones who are going to be affected by those issues. And I feel like in some ways that tells you why the U.S. stories tend to follow those more game or horse race kind of frames on the elections. Those issue stories are a lot harder to report. 
If I want to report strategy, I want to talk to media analysts and I want to talk to campaign workers, there are people who it is their job to get in front of me, in front of a camera, in front of my notebook. And, you know, they're ready, willing and eager to talk to me. In fact, they're reaching out and trying to ask me to cover them. And somewhat the same way in terms of the politicians themselves. Uh, politicians tend to be a little bit busier when they're on the campaign trail. So those uh, analysts and campaign workers are the easiest. The issue stories, contacting those regular people, those voters who are going to be actually affected by things, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to find them, to go to them, to convince them to talk to you, all of those different kinds of things. And do remember that the media is a business, right? Any newspaper that you read, any TV show that you watch, any website that you look at, it has a purpose. And its purpose is somewhat to tell the uh, truth or give you good information. But a lot of their purpose is to make money for the shareholders in the media company. And so because media is a business, easier stories are cheaper to report. And so that tends to push the coverage in that direction. Other research has suggested that the coverage that people see in campaigns, it does actually help to engage voters. It helps to turn voters out. But research by um, a researcher named Angelo and another one named Chappal show that there's actually that reciprocal relationship between the um, people running and the media. And it's important to remember that elections play a big role in media as well. And you can almost think of the news cycle as having thin and fat years. And so thin years are years when you just have ordinary stuff that's going on. It's not things that are really encouraging people to tune in or click. And fat years are the years when you are making a lot of money. And those fat years, you have those good juicy stories, which often are those conflict frames and those strategy frames. And it's also the years when the campaigns are paying you a lot of money to run their ads. And so those fat years can be really great for the media, but the pressures are in a direction that's really not always great for democracy. So sorry to start on such a kind of a negative note, but I do miss being in the newsroom on election night. But let's have something a little bit more positive and think about, is something better when it's all natural? Let's find out in this week's warm up. All natural, all the better, maybe. But you do want to be careful about something called the appeal to nature fallacy. So in this, someone is deciding that something is good or bad based on its perceived natural or unnatural qualities. Is it artificial? Is it chemical? You know, those are words they might use. Or do you find it in nature? And someone who falls in with this fallacy is going to say, if I find it in nature, it must be harmless, or maybe it even has to be beneficial. And when they're doing that, they're using the notion of natural as a basis for evaluating the value or the morality of something without considering objective evidence or logical reasoning. This kind of argument shows up in a lot of places. So for example, I've seen arguments that female animals raise the young for the species and therefore humans being animals. Women should also stay home and raise their children, right? Women should not be in the workplace. I've also seen arguments that organic food or raw food is more nutritious. And then Around COVID, we saw a lot of things. People were nervous, especially before we had the vaccines. What can I do to not get this disease? And you'd see stories like you should rub vapor rub on your feet or that you can tell if you're susceptible to COVID by taking deep breaths and how long can you hold your breath and those kind of things. So let's listen to a couple of clips where people are maybe using that appeal to nature fallacy. Ever wondered how to combat common health issues naturally? Enter colloidal silver, a solution of tiny silver particles suspended in a liquid. This natural warrior stands as a formidable foe against harmful bacteria, viruses, and fungi. This clip came from a channel on a video service called Rumble. And Rumble is sort of a competitor to YouTube. It is uh, it was actually started out of Canada, been invested in by people like Peter Thiel and J.D. Vance. And it has uh, a a bunch of different kinds of video content on it, but it tries to be sort of like YouTube. This video came from a Faceless Facts channel, right? So they're showing a video and everything in that video doesn't have a person. It's not attributed to a person. They're just sharing what sound like a bunch of facts with a bunch of what they call background roll or B-roll in it. Um, and so this one is about uh, silver. These faceless facts channels, by the way, are very common on social media, particularly short video media like Instagram Reels or TikTok. So let's talk about silver. It is true that silver in some forms is antimicrobial, so it kills nasty things that make you sick. And in fact, you can find used in medicine some bandages and some creams that contain silver. 
So from that perspective, it's true. But it's sufficiently untrue or has so many nuances to it that a guy you might remember named Jim Baker. So Jim Baker was a televangelist who, with his um, wife at the time, Tammy Faye Baker, they had a big and popular TV show and they collected millions and millions and millions of dollars from people who believed in them. Ended up, Jim Baker ended up going to jail. And he is back and is on um, videos where he talks about a bunch of different things. And he was actually fined by the New York Attorney General uh, more than $150,000 for making claims about these drinks and gels that he was selling that contained this silver in it. In particular, the um, people who sued him objected to his use of a naturopathic doctor. So a naturopathic doctor, it's a form of alternative medicine. So we use the word doctor, but it's not trained as a doctor. And this naturopathic doctor said that other coronaviruses were killed by these silver products that Jim Baker was selling in 12 hours. So you would expect that this natural silver product would, in fact, cure COVID as well. Um, so let's listen to one more example. But people talk about cap and tax, and they're sure exactly what we're talking about. But let's get back to step one. What is the problem? Why do we have to have this tax in the first place? It's about carbon dioxide. Well, what is carbon dioxide? Let's just go to a fundamental question. Carbon dioxide, Mr. Speaker, is a natural byproduct of nature. Carbon dioxide is natural. It occurs in Earth. It is a part of the regular life cycle of Earth. In fact, life on planet Earth can't even exist without carbon dioxide. So necessary is it to human life, to animal life, to plant life, to the oceans, to the vegetation that's on the Earth, to the, to the fowl that, that, that flies in the air. We need to have carbon dioxide as a part of the fundamental life cycle of Earth. As a matter of fact, carbon dioxide is portrayed as harmful, but there isn't even one study that can be produced that shows that carbon dioxide is a harmful gas. There isn't one such study because carbon dioxide is not a harmful gas. It is a harmless gas. Carbon dioxide is natural. It is not harmful. It is a part of Earth's life cycle and yet we're being told that we have to reduce this natural substance and reduce the american standard of living to create an arbitrary reduction in something that is naturally occurring in the earth well we're told the crux of this problem is human activity it's humans that are creating more carbon dioxide is that true or is that false what you just heard there was a representative from minnesota named michelle bachman and she was speaking in Congress in a hearing on capping carbon dioxide emissions. And her whole argument is an appeal to nature. So she says carbon dioxide is a natural product of nature, right? It's found in nature and therefore it cannot be harmful, is the essence of her argument, which by the way, goes on for several more minutes after this. So remember that a lot of things in nature are in fact harmful. So for example, killer bees or tetanus is a natural product or apricot pits are a natural product. Um, many of those things, they're found in nature, but they cannot just be assumed to be harmless because they are natural. All right, I need to take a quick break, but when I come back, we're going to take a look at what can be done to fight disinformation in a country that has protections for free speech. So I hope you'll stay around for my uninterrupted interview with Barbara McQuaid. Welcome back. My guest this week is Barbara McQuaid. Professor McQuaid teaches criminal law, national security, and some other things at the University of Michigan Law School. She's a regular commentator for MSNBC and NBC, and she is the former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. She even has a little bit of journalism experience, and I invited her on the show so we could talk about her very interesting new book called Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America. So, Professor McQuaid, welcome to Unspun. Thanks. Glad to be with you. Yeah. And um, I really enjoyed reading your book. And so the first question I had for you was, what inspired you to write this book? Sort of what was your goal with it? Yeah, I've been teaching uh, national security law at the University of Michigan Law School now for the past seven years or so. 
And more and more in class, we have been talking about disinformation and it, the threat it poses to national security, focusing originally on the 2016 election and the Mueller report and the way Russia used uh, an influence campaign by posing as Americans online uh, and fooling people into believing that all of this was true. So I really got interested in it there. And then I, you know, since that time, we've seen it evolve into something that American politicians and influencers are using against each other, against all of us. And so I think it's um, a fascinating area. Technology is making it very difficult for us to harness. And uh, I was just interested really in learning more about it. One of the things that you start with is a premise that in a democracy, it's important that people have a shared set of facts that they use to sort of debate and to make decisions. And this is an idea, you know, that other influential historical figures have also supported. But can you explain why for you that's a core truth? It, it, it's so essential. You know, of course, we live in a democracy. We have all different kinds of people with different viewpoints and uh, different policy preferences. Understandable. But before we can begin to debate and solve problems, we have to have a shared understanding of the facts. And if we begin from a place where some people believe one thing and another believes another thing, it's very difficult to come to any common understanding. And one example I cite in the book is the experience of Representative Justin Amash. She's a Republican from West Michigan who voted in favor of impeaching Donald Trump uh, over um the uh, Mueller report, all the things that he read there or, or called for the impeachment. And um, when he met with his constituents in West Michigan and discussed with them what was in the Mueller report, many of the people who showed up at the town hall meeting, you would assume these are engaged people, informed citizens, showed up, said they had never heard that Mueller had found that Russia did influence the election, that Trump and his campaign welcomed the assistance that they shared polling data, that they met with Russians at Trump Tower, that they coordinated communications with uh, messaging based on stolen emails from the DNC. They had never even heard that. And so, you know, they can't begin to assess his vote or a position on that issue unless they know the facts. Now, maybe they disagree with the ultimate decision, but we have to have the same set of facts. And I worry that in our society today, where we've become so polarized, we're all looking at different media, we're all on different social media sites. We don't even know the, the facts other people uh, are, are presuming are true so that we can even begin to debunk them. That's such a great point, I think, that we're not, we don't even know what other people think. Um, one of the things that you talk about is that newsmakers have a kind of a special role when it comes to disinformation and misinformation. And when I think about it, I can kind of see that going two ways. One could be that they sort of help to spread the bad information, but the other is that they just kind of go along with it and don't call it out when they see it. Which one do you think is kind of the bigger issue? Yeah, I, I think both are true. And I think the bigger problem is those who know they are spreading disinformation. Um, you know, Russians, when they were involved in uh, propaganda campaigns in the early part of the 20th century, referred to people who got fooled into believing false information as useful idiots. Uh, you know, people are willing to spread misinformation. They read something, they believe it to be true, and they pass it on. That's that's a problem. And that certainly exists in our social media world, where it's very easy to read something on Facebook or Twitter or X and then share it with others and spread that, that misinformation. But I think the more egregious offenders are those who absolutely know better. You know, for example, I believe that uh, senators like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, Ivy League educated lawyers, absolutely understood that the election was not stolen in 2020. And yet they were willing to give credence to those lies to help stir up uh, the public and to even challenge the counting of the certificates um, on, on January 6th of 2020. And I'm certain they knew better. These are smart guys. They pay attention. And so those who know better. Another example is Fox News. You know, of course, they paid that exorbitant settlement to Dominion voting systems for giving oxygen to the lie that voting machines flipped votes in favor of Biden uh, and, and against Donald Trump. Um, they knew better. There were emails that got exposed during that trial uh, that showed 
that they absolutely knew that Joe Biden had won the election, but they lost viewers when they began to report that, when they called Arizona for Joe Biden. Uh, They stopped getting viewers and ratings mattered more to them than truth and accuracy. And so uh, they would put up, you know, air things like Tucker Carlson talking about how uh, this was all just uh, a false flag operation or ordinary uh, public discourse that happened at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, So they paid the price for that. And, you know, one would hope that that would cause them to stop what they're doing or others. And then just, you know, like two weeks later, they referred to Joe Biden as a wannabe dictator had charged his political opponent, Donald Trump. So it's um, there's big money and big political gain in false information. And so I think that is why people traffic in it. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a really important point, I think, for me as a journalism professor, which is kind of the media's role in all of this. Um, One of the things that you talk about in the book is the liar's dividend, right? So allowing people to sort of dismiss unflattering things as fake news. How much do you think that that is, I guess, due to influence on the media? And how much do you think it is like the changing economic model of the media, right? That, you know, the subscribers as viewers are actually like important to their survival. Yeah, um, I think journalism has a really important role to play here in debunking false claims and providing accurate information, especially local media. You know, we've become so focused on national news because we don't have local newspapers and radio stations uh, to help us work through local issues like school board issues and state budgets and county budgets, and roads, things that really matter to people where they live. And so instead, we're looking at Washington and the national stage and what's going on there. And this idea of the liar's dividend is exploiting disinformation to push out more disinformation or to deny uh, accurate claims that are unflattering or unhelpful. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is fond of saying that's fake news, anything that he doesn't like. Um, this is part of what has gone on in Russia in recent decades. Um, there, Vladimir Putin you know, is a former KGB officer, and it is referred to as the fog of unknowability. Uh, people are fed all kinds of alternative theories and stories for things. And it, at some point, they don't know what to make of it. And so they so well, everybody's lying. Everything's PR. I am uh, I can't keep track of what's what's accurate, and what's not anymore. So I'm going to just throw up my hands and disengage from politics. And I'm just going to focus on my job, my family and the things that matter to me. And that, of course, is incredibly dangerous because when that happens, then those in power are able to abuse their power without our notice. Well, and it takes us back to kind of your first point about the shared set of facts, right? That if you start assuming there's no facts, then we have nothing to share anymore. It's always kind of amused me to hear newsmakers talk about, you know, X news source lies all the time when they say something unflattering, but then they cite X news source as a source of truth in the next sentence. I also wonder about, you know, we're right in the middle of primaries, obviously. Um, what, What the media might learn about their sort of past failures in election coverage um, you know, it seems like a lot of election coverage is strategy and horse race rather than policy. And it's been that way for decades now at this point. What kind of reforms do journalists need in their ethics and practices if they're going to kind of rebuild that public trust? Yeah, I think they really need to fact check um, claims of politicians. Uh, and as a result, they, they need to be paying attention to what politicians are saying. I think it's very easy for us to spend all our time in our own news bubble. Um, you know, there's maybe... You live in Fox News World and Breitbart, and you only see what's online on right-wing media sources. You only know one thing. And yet, if you are perhaps a more progressive person, you are following MSNBC and the New York Times and looking at your own social media. You're never connecting and seeing what others are putting out there. I think it's really important for mainstream media to, I, I think right now there's a tendency to want to ignore what, say, Donald Trump is saying at his rallies or on his truth social posts. I think it's really important to see what he is saying there and to debunk it. Um, He is making all kinds of awful uh, false claims right now about Jack Smith, the special counsel, calling him a deranged thug, saying that he is uh, on a mission from a person he calls crooked Joe Biden uh, to bring a politically motivated um, charge against him. You know, in my view, this is uh, an indictment based on probable cause found by a grand jury with documented facts. and so to call it that, and um, I think the public needs to know what he is saying so that it can be responded to. 
In the same way, he refers to Liz Cheney, uh, a Republican who led, of course, the House Select Committee um, it, to make these findings of fact, who is one of really only a, a handful of Republicans with the courage to call this out uh, to her own political detriment. And he goes after her as well. Um, so I, I think it, there's a tendency to want to ignore all of that. And um, I, I understand that because sometimes when you give it too much oxygen, people believe it. You know, repetition is one of the keys to disinformation. But I think people need to know what's out there so that it can be debunked. Because if we don't know what our neighbor has been exposed to, it's difficult for us to engage in an informed debate with them. No, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that we notice, you know, on my end with the uh, news media is that it's not super fun being a member of the press now. You know, if you're a member of a press who's going to, you know, for example, a political rally, um, you can sometimes feel, you know, physically unsafe there. Do you think the news media has responsibility in the way that politicians treat them? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I don't think anything the press has done merits the kinds of things that we have seen from Donald Trump and his supporters, you know, referring to the press as the enemy of the people. I mean, that that goes back to Hitler's Germany when they refer to the press as the Lugan press, meaning lying press. Uh, you know, don't believe what you see with your own eyes. Um, you know, believe me instead. Uh, and so I think the press has a really important watchdog role to play to report what's happening. And there will be people in politics who don't like it because some of it is unflattering or uh, critical of what they're doing. Um, but to some extent, I do think the the, the media, and I, I say the media, I don't want to group all members of the media into one monolith. You know, certainly there is responsible journalism uh, and other. But, um, you know, when it becomes more about um, uh, reality television, story, simple storylines of good versus evil and, you know, villains and those kinds of things, I, I do think we do a disservice to the public. I think instead what we need to do is, you know, ha unpack, have a clear-eyed, sober assessment of uh, of facts so that we can engage in policy debates. As you said, so much of the coverage now is about the horse race of politics as opposed to talking about governing. And, um, you know, campaigning is uh, is one thing, but governing is quite another. And We've really lost sight of one for the other. Like I personally believe right now, we, we always see as we approach a campaign, uh, a crisis at the border. Um, our border is under constant crisis and we need uh, elected leaders to address it with real legislation to see what we can do at our border. And yet it is uh, you know, sort of ignored for months and months. And then when an election is upon us, there's all kinds of drama at the border because people know it's a divisive issue. And so rather than solve the problem, they exploit the problem for political gain. You know, that's not governing. That's not responsible leadership. That's about putting campaigning ahead of governing. And I think the media bites um, and they take the bait on all of that. And so, um, you know, right now you're we're reading and hearing a lot about what's going on at the board. It, this, this should be an ongoing uh, issue that we cover, not one that flares up every time an election is around the corner. Yeah, interesting. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is the idea of abuse of the courts. And I know right now we're inundated with news from assorted lawsuits all over the country. Can you explain what that is and maybe provide an example? Yeah. So, you know, our courts are all about enforcing the rule of law. And in a country like ours, really in any country, but here especially where we have such divergent views, such diversity of population, we have always agreed that we will resolve our disputes in courts. We do not resort to vigilante violence. We do not take the law into our own hands. We go to court, we make our best case, and then we accept the decisions that they make. Um, we have seen bashing of courts. I mean, Donald Trump has made a sport out of bashing judges. Uh, uh, he calls them so-called judges uh, when they rule against him uh, or even preside in this case. I mean, look what he's done to Judge Engeron in New York and his law clerk in his fraud case, uh, he has gone after the federal judge assigned to the election interference case, and she has received death threats. You know, is one cause and effect? I don't know, but one precedes the other. Uh, there's certainly some relationship there. And so when we diminish our confidence in the courts with this constant bashing of the courts, I think it is not surprising that we see things like threats or vigilante violence. So, you know, uh, attacking the husband of Nancy Pelosi, looking for Nancy Pelosi herself, uh, the attack against um, the, the plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, 
uh, to put her on trial because people are not satisfied with the justice they get in courts. That, I think, is the inevitable result of the kind of rhetoric that we are seeing bashing the courts and undermining public confidence in them. When I was a U.S. attorney, I was always trained and I always practiced uh, expressing respect for the courts, even when we disagreed with the outcome. So if, you know, we'd had a big case and a jury had returned a verdict against us or a judge had ruled against us, you know, we would say things like reasonable minds can disagree uh, about a legal case and we respect the decision of the court. Um, that That is being lost. And I think we need responsible leaders who Good. adhere to those principles. Okay. Um, you also, you know, you kind of end the book with a section of like, what can we do about all of these problems? And um, one of the things that you talked about was... Um, maybe some reforms to Section 230. So that's a part that sort of regulates the kind of information that you can carry online and if you're responsible for the content of the information that you carry, as I understand it. Not trained as a lawyer, so please correct me if I'm wrong with that. If you'd made those kind of reforms, what would that look like for online platforms? What would they then become responsible for or liable for? Yeah, so um, I am not amending, suggesting amending Section 230, and I think the way some people have been talking about it, which is, I'm making uh, platforms responsible for content. Instead, where I think the action is, is regulating the algorithms. You may remember Francis Haugen, who was a whistleblower, who was previously a data scientist for Facebook, uh, came in and testified before Congress and exposed the way algorithms push us to that which outrages us, because that's what keeps us online. And that is how um, platforms like Facebook and others monetize their model. And so... Um, you know, content regulation is very challenging in light of the First Amendment to tell people what they can and can't say, what they can and can't put up, what they can and can't take down. But we can uh, require them to uh, rein in algorithms that pushes rage. We can require them to disclose the algorithms that they're using so that people are informed consumers about which ones are doing that and which ones are not. Um, we could also regulate social media platforms like utilities. So when it comes to, you know, the water company or the electric company or the gas company, there are rules in place about what they can do and what they can't do because we see it as serving a public service. And so, you know, it's a quasi public private partnership that uh, requires certain behavior if you want to play in this space. And so I think there's a lot more we could do. I think one of the challenges that we have seen is when we have congressional hearings on these things. We see how our members of Congress are so ill-suited to discuss these issues. Um, they, it often reminds me of those progressive ads about becoming their, you know, your parents, where they just are completely baffled by something going on in society. Am I hashtagging right now? But um, you know, Congress has solved important problems before, and they do it by hiring committee staff who is knowledgeable about these things and then uh, people who can translate that to the rest of us and to lawmakers so that we can enact meaningful reform. So we really just need the political will to make this a priority so that we can rein in the wild, wild west that currently exists on social media platforms. OK. And so, again, since I'm not trained as an attorney, that would fit in with sort of First Amendment concerns. That wouldn't be a problem there. Or... Yeah. So the First Amendment concerns come in when you are regulating content, when you're telling people what they can and can't put online. And when you're telling them what they uh, must take down or must moderate, uh, instead of doing those things, we could have uh, algorithms, uh, regulation of algorithms, so that uh, people are aware, can just be uh, choosier consumers of what is being put online. We could also uh, have requirements that when uh, disinformation is flagged, there are alerts to um, accurate sources of information. Um, you know, for example, things relating to voting. It doesn't have to say whether it is or isn't. Uh, this relates to voting. You might want to check out this website at the Secretary of State's office in your state um, to see for yourself whether this claim is accurate. I think we could do those kinds of things as well. So um, I think technology can be the answer to problems created by technology. You know, for example, I think uh, people are worried about artificial intelligence and understandably so. You know, deep fakes, I think, are going to create a lot of challenges in political campaigns. But we could also use AI to help us detect what's fake and what's real. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would challenge the, uh, you know, the AI creators out there to help us 
not, not just combat disinformation, but utilize AI as a tool to help us um, identify disinformation. So when I got to the end of the book, it was a whole, you know, a book about misinformation and the problem and some solutions at the end. And so I just wanted to ask you as kind of a final question, what gives you hope in sort of the seeking for truth and democratic discourse? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I make a number of um, micro suggestions like the ones that we've talked about here. But I think from a macro perspective, what we really need is for Americans to um, put love of country ahead of love of party. Uh, we've seen very few people do that in, in current society. You know, I, I look to Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger as an example, Mitt Romney, others willing to call out lies uh, and put their own political welfare on the line for that. So those people give me hope that there are people out there who are willing to speak truth to power. Um, and I think ultimately we can defeat this uh, you know, strain of dis disinformation. We're at a moment right now where the internet has grown into a little bit of a monster. You know, It started as a a cute little baby alligator that was growing in the bathtub and could do fun things and watch fun cat videos. Uh, and now it's it's become a teenager and it's getting unwieldy and it doesn't fit in the bathtub anymore and it's become a, a man eater. So how do we rein it in? Well, we have to figure it out. And uh, I'm confident that we will. We've overcome challenges before, but I think we need responsible leadership to look to opportunities and not fear. Um, and you know, hope, as it always has, will prevail over fear, fear um, if we, the people, choose to. All right. Wonderful. Well, Barb McQuaid, thank you so much for appearing on Unspun with us. I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Glad to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for getting Unspun with me this week. Unspun is a production of me, Amanda Sturgill, and is a proud member of the MSW Media family of podcasts. Send me your thoughts and ideas about trickery in the news on Gmail at theunspunpodcast at gmail.com. I even write back. And find this episode's show notes and more information at theunspunpodcast.substack.com. Want to learn more and get smarter? Check out my book, Detecting Deception, Tools to Fight Fake News, which is available on Amazon or your favorite online bookseller. And until next time, stay sharp, everyone. <laughs>